everybody. It is March 13th, and just always a big pleasure to have our good friend, Mr. Martin Armstrong, rogue economist and well-known with, within the financial community around the world as a premier expert. Welcome back, Martin. Well, it's always a ple- pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So much has happened. We just talked to you not even about a month ago. Bitcoin went bananas. Uh, gold went bananas. Silver perked up a little bit. The shares aren't perking up. But, you know, gold, at least for a while, broke out to a brand new all-time high on a monthly and weekly basis. We haven't seen any of this in a long time. Do you think it's just on the rate cut expectations? or No, this is really uh, all about geopolitical. If you just really did your analysis, historically, you would find that, you know, as interest rates rise, so does inflation and so does the stock market and even gold. When interest rates decline, what do you get? Great Depression from 6% you know, down to 1%, uh, great recessions. I mean, this idea of interest rates, I mean, it has been you know, a, a myth that has been created by mainstream media, which has, if anybody just double checks, uh, you'll see it's, it's nonsense. Uh, interest rates started going up when Trump was elected in 16. They called it the Trump rally. They didn't pay attention to the interest rates. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's just, this is really, you know, what's happening here is uh, pretty much the world is starting to wake up that we have leaders virtually everywhere that all they want to do is create war. And uh, pretty much that uh, it looks as though they really need it because the financial system, as we've known it, is really starting to crumble. I mean, you got Biden here proposing, you know, a seven and a half trillion dollar annual budget. I mean, uh, oh, once to raise taxes. I mean, all you got to do is is just put the two together on a chart, and you'll see that raise taxes, and guess what happens? GDP declines. Um, you know, they don't learn. You know, that's all I could ever tell you that uh, they just do not learn. Well, you know, it certainly seems you certainly seem to be right, Martin. I mean, everywhere we look. Um, the one thing is you you can really count on the Fed, can't you? Unlike so many things in life, they pretty much follow through with whatever ridiculous <laughs> plans they they announce. At least they try to. <laughs> and uh, can they actually afford to cut rates now with inflation so strong? Not really, because they'll end up being blamed for it. But um, y- you have to understand the Fed is is everybody tends to blame the Fed, but the Fed's not really the problem. The, the Fed's between a rock and a hard place. All central banks can do is set the short-term rate. That's it. Okay. The whole quantitative easing thing was buying in bonds to try to lower the long term, which is mortgages, etc. They can't set that. So, you know, they do it indirectly. But <clears throat> the problem is is that these people think that it's the Fed that creates money and it's not it's Congress. I mean, look at this budget from from Biden seven point you know almost seven and a half trillion dollars. All right, that's more debt that goes out, and the debt is simply interest. You know, currency that pays interest. That's it. Um, before Brenton Woods collapsed, if you had a an e bond. And you went to the bank and said, here, I just want to borrow against it. It was illegal. You could not borrow against government debt. That's where the theory what came from, basically, that it was less inflationary to borrow than to print. Now you use the, the, the debt as collateral. You want to trade futures, you can post T-bills. All right. So that theory is, is gone. It, it, and people haven't woken up. That, that's long gone. All right. So basically, the the major factor in creating money is Congress. It's not the Fed. And 
because all that debt just comes out and it's, you know, that's why the Fed got into quantitative easing because it was trying to, it was too much long-term debt out there. And so they were trying to, to buy some in to lower the long-term interest rate for mortgages and that failed. So uh, it, it's, we're, we're in a place where people will venture, I think over the next, I would say three to five years, they're going to wake up to this, that it's not the central banks, it's just government, period. Well, how do CDBCs, do you think, how will that factor in here? These are central bank digital currencies. I, I think I said it wrong, CBDC. Um, you know, they, funny how, isn't it funny how they vilified cryptos, Martin, for, oh, I don't know, almost 15 years, and now suddenly every central banker around the world is scrambling to implement their own a cryptocurrency. It's stunning. Well, it, it's, you know, actually predictable because um, the whole idea of eliminating cash and going to a digital uh, currency is that um, they think they're going to collect 35% more in taxes. I mean, you, you hire that 16-year-old girl next door to watch the kids while you and your wife go out, and you gave her $20, you know, oh, my God, she didn't pay taxes, you know. Um, there's a guy at the corner, I'm homeless, and you give him some money, oh, where's his taxes? You know, they think that eliminating cash will increase the tax revenue by 35%, and that's their their minimum expectation. So... Um, and then they talk to themselves, oh, we'll eliminate crime, uh, we'll eliminate uh, a lot of different things, uh, drug business. Well, you know, basically, you know, these are people that, you know, I've argued with in meetings. And I said, I don't care what you do, whatever you raise in taxes, you people will still always spend more. And it, the problem is it's socialism. That's it. They don't know how to run for office without trying to, to bribe the people. Vote for me and I'll do this. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll reduce student loans. I'll do everything they do is to bribe the people. So that's why it's, it's you know, the, the system itself is collapsing because we've run, you know, we've kicked the cans down uh, the road so far and uh, with this budget that Biden's proposing, you're looking at the national debt's going to go to 45 trillion within a couple of years. I mean, it's it's just totally out of control at this point. But Martin, what would you say to the naysayer who was saying, yeah, I agree with you, but what if growth is keeping up with our debt? Is that fallacious? Because you would have the data. You would know. Well, the the problem is is that the growth has been more in the um, asset side, and the which they also see is is non taxable. So you buy a house uh, for you know two hundred thousand, and all of a sudden it's worth five hundred thousand. All right, and so you can borrow against that, but you don't have to pay taxes unless you sell it. And then it's a capital gain. They don't like this. You know, they, you know, there have been actual proposals to tax people on unrealized gains. So if your house just went up 300 grand, they want a tax on that. If it goes down, you know, back down, you know, oh, well, you don't get a refund. I mean, these are the proposals I've actually seen and, and screamed to people about. It, it's just completely nuts. You, you in Australia, they were pr actually proposing that when you die, everything belongs to the state, and you shouldn't have anything to give to your children because that's not fair. Uh, everybody should start from zero. I mean, you know, when you get these people involved in socialism, it is yeah. I mean, it's. Um, it's Atlas Shrug, basically, <laughs> and, and and that's where you end up at. It, it's, I mean, the, right now, um, I mean, even <clears throat> we have uh, 
an audit going on about, you know, employees. And if, you know, they want to know, okay, fine, we see we pay, uh, like, write a check to some company. Well, is that really an employee? Is that an individual? Maybe, you know, they should be paying taxes here, you know. It's like, it's a company, all right? They pay their own employees. This is how, where we're going. They are so desperate for for money. It's like you have to now prove everybody that you even give anything to. And, oh, you know, what are they? What did they do with the money? You know, et cetera. This is why they want these CBDCs. Uh, and I can tell you even there, for a long time, and I know a lot of people didn't necessarily agree with me, but uh, honestly, I think Bitcoin was started by them covertly to get everybody used to cryptocurrencies. And um, because, look, what's it do? It, it provides the absolute perfect trace for them. If I give you a hundred dollar bill, they don't know where it came from. But if I give you a hundred in Bitcoin, they can see where I got it from. And go all the way down the line. This is their panacea. All right. And I can tell you what's actually happening with CBDCs, which people aren't really talking about yet. But the top five banks are all developing their own. Why? Because they have <clears throat> realized that the Federal Reserve cannot do it. Why? Because it would be unconstitutional. So they're using what they did in COVID. All right. You read the First Amendment. What's it say? It says the government shall not. All right. Has got nothing to do with Facebook, YouTube, any, everybody else can, because you have no actual right to free speech. That's a misnomer. It's the government cannot do something to you to stop it, but everybody else can. All right, so they're doing that with the CBDCs. If the banks develop the CBDC, they then can report to the government, hey, looks like this guy's doing something strange. Thank you very much. Okay, then they can investigate you because they didn't do it themselves. If they, if the Fed did it, they would need a search warrant. If... <clears throat> The bank does it. Hey, there's already rules in place, and they do this currently. They have to file a suspicious activity report. You put $100,000 in cash in your account, they're writing a report, and they're informing the IRS. Hey, we don't know where it came from. You better take a look at this. This is where we're going. It's The, the banks are basically involved in this. And the Fed will not issue a CBDC. Wow. Okay, that's a powerful statement. No CBDC from our Treasury Department or the Fed, U.S. Fed, from Martin Armstrong today on GoldSeek.com Radio. All right, so, Martin, um, but you know, Society General and so many of the other big banks around the world are working with their um, governments, and you just think that this is um, a non sequitur. It just doesn't follow. Yeah, I mean, this is all about taxes. That's the whole objective here. Um, they are convinced that the underground economy is at least 35% of the above ground. And these people, rather than looking at reform, it's like, well, gee, there's more money on the table. I should get that. You know, look at Janet Yellen. I mean, she actually had the audacity to say that the, they wanted to audit transactions at six hundred dollars. All right, to get the rich, you know. I don't think Elon Musk is selling his bike for six hundred dollars on 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 eBay. All right, but uh, her definition of rich, what is it? Anybody that works. That's really what's at stake here. I mean, the country is falling apart left and right, and. It's not going to survive this. I know it. It's it, it's stunning. I mean, remember when we were coming up, Martin, at least for me, the whole idea was when things were ailing, 
you know, big government recognized pull back, stop taxing, lower taxes. You have a stronger economy. The economy grows. Uh, people open up more businesses. They they save more. They invest more. You have a, a robust technology sector. Um, education thrives. Uh, the middle class thrives. The working class thrives. And the rich get richer. And now the, they've got it all inverted, it seems to me, upside down, and, and, and they're increasing taxes when you should be lowering taxes to stimulate economic growth and investment. I, yeah, the, it's just, it's what's in it for them. I, I was part of, I was asked back in the 90s to uh, come up with a proposal to revise Social Security to turn it into a, uh, a wealth fund where it actually invested. Um, and the Dow was like a thousand at the time. And I set this up. I said, okay, fine. This is how we do it. They submit their track record. We basically make the judgment on that, on that, uh, on the track records. Democrats wouldn't vote for it because they wanted to be able to change the fund managers when they got back in power. And I said, this has got nothing to do with who the guy voted for. I don't care. All right. Who has the best performance? I don't care if he never voted. <laughs> you know, I said, that's not a question on the, on the, you know, on the application. They would not vote for it for that. Uh, and I mean, had we done that, Social Security would be in, in making an absolute fortune. It's a 40,000 versus a thousand. All right. Instead of going broke. Uh, everything that I worked with uh, on Capitol Hill back then, it's it's out the window completely. Uh, it, it's you know back in 1985. All right, I warned them. I said you know because <clears throat> if you managed money according to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and you manage money on the SEC side. You couldn't do it together. And if I had, uh, I had turned down actually an offer to run the $60 billion fund. And I said, no, not interested. An equity fund. Why? Because the maximum by law I could hedge was 17%. If I went beyond that using futures, now I'm a futures fund. Okay. I'm not an equity fund. And I warned them. I said, you have to merge these two agencies. They're at war with each other. They wouldn't do it because if they did that, then a whole bunch of people would lose their jobs. So then what happened? You created the hedge fund industry. You had to go offshore to do it. And now they go, oh, that's unregulated. You're the ones that created it. Hey, Martin, I hate to interrupt you, but you, you've really fascinated me. One of my passions is strategic and tactical investing, especially using options um, as, a, you might say, to shield your profits, okay, so as a hedge, if you will. And um, I, there's all kinds of strategies. I, I really like Nassim Taleb's barbell strategy. I think he's one of the few people to understand risk maybe better than anyone in all of history. But I'm really really interested in Martin Armstrong's uh, methods for hedging against risk if he were running a portfolio. Your number one risk is, is on an international portfolio is currency. Um, that's why we ended up basically being so big all over the place, because we were the only ones doing it. And... Um, Actually, we were going to open up an office in Geneva in 1985, and I met with one of the, you know, the one of our clients who was the big one of the top banks there. We went to lunch, and I had a bunch of list of names, uh, like European names, European advisors, or whatever, because I knew there was a lot of anti-Americanism there. And he said to me, he says, "Name uh, one European analyst," and I couldn't at the time. I, and I was embarrassed. I said, I'm sure there are. I just I just don't know of any. And he says, no, there are none. And he says, you don't realize why everybody uses you. And I said, no. <laughs> What's... And he says, because you don't care if the dollar goes up or down. And he said, after World War II, he explained to me that the politicians, if the Deutsche Mark was up 20%, see, I did a good job. 
So no analyst could come out and say the Deutsche Mark would ever go down because it was a political statement. In America, it wasn't. And so we ended up international hedging, I would have to take, you know, these huge portfolios. We were dealing in trillions and trillions of dollars back then. All right. And we would have to sell assets in one country and buy assets in another and create a natural hedge uh, because the markets weren't big enough to even hedge uh, a bet on something. So we were like, you know, dealing with companies buying all the courage pubs in England, et cetera, but funding it by borrowing in Swiss francs. I mean, it was very interesting. Uh, but I mean, that you had to, on an international level, the number one thing you have to look at uh, after, cur- after country risk, uh, which is like Iran, for example, you wouldn't invest there because they confiscate assets, um, is currency. And that's what's going on right now, talking about um, de-dollarization, et cetera. People don't understand that either. It's political risk. Once the U.S. <clears throat> put sanctions in against Russia, it was absolutely brain dead because now that was a warning sign to the rest of the world if you don't do as we tell you, we'll remove you from SWIFT. So all of a sudden, you have China creating its chip system, Iran doing the same thing, because now there's a political risk to the dollar. It's not how much dollars and money and all that and fiat and all that nonsense. There's political risk that if you are doing dollars and they can remove you from SWIFT, now you can't do business. So you needed an alternative system, and that's what the BRICS is all about. Wow. Well, the BRICS, that's the big story. You know, I mean, take a look at the number of, what is it, close to 30, maybe more nations lining up, um, just vying for position, you know, for an opportunity, uh, you know, to join uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South uh, South Africa, and now I guess Saudi Arabia is in there. Who knows how many others have recently added. The big talk I'm hearing is that they are going to initiate a gold-backed currency uh, at some point, Martin. do you Have you heard anything about this? Yes. I mean, you see, that, that comes back to the gold bug type thing, uh, and that's not it, – it's not – uh, it's not really plausible uh, because what happens is is that um, money supply has to expand and and contract with the economy. Uh, that is what Keynes was talking about to some degree, but you know the politicians only took the one sided deficit spending. Keynes also said you reduce taxes. Uh, they didn't want to hear that. Uh, but um, that's why Brent Woods collapsed. So you can't have a uh, a gold backed currency that's fixed. All right. The only way you could possibly do this would be uh, that it's an international transaction would be uh, equivalent in a floating value of gold. All right. It, it, it go back to the 13th, 14th centuries. They all pretty much did that. They used gold for international transactions and silver for domestic. Um, it's called the two tier system. That could possibly work. All right. Um, otherwise, then you get into the, the, the risk of a political uh, situation. What if it's China and the one that just simply replaces the dollar? Now you've got the political risk on that side. So, um, you know, that's re- it's it's what people are looking at. It's not necessarily what the currency is backed by. Uh, a currency is backed effectively by its own people in the economy. Uh, that's why everybody, the dollar became really the reserve currency because everybody wanted to sell their BMWs and Toyotas to American consumers. All right. Um, 
In fact, I, that's one of the areas that we were involved in. Um, with Toyota, when they were they were looking at it, I said, okay, fine. The way you you want to beat the Germans is the Germans in the 70s, the German cars, oh, they're better, always increasing in value. No, it was the fact that they priced their, their cars in Deutschmark. And as the dollar went down, a German car kept going up. I mean, I bought a Porsche in 1970, drove it around for two years, and sold it and made money on it. <laughs> uh, that that was the currency flow, all right? It wasn't that, you know, people were buying Ferraris and they thought that it was a Ferraris the, an investment. No, it's not. It was all currency, all right? So <clears throat> with the Japanese, I showed them how to do it. They priced it in dollars consistently over here. And so they, they basically carved out a big niche against the Germans, then we were called in by Mercedes, and they said, "Look, do for us what you did for the Japanese." All right, so we 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 had to revise how they price things, and you took the the currency risk. If you priced it six in dollars, then you had a, a currency risk, and we took the currency risk back to Germany or to Japan, and you managed the currency risk, and that way your product was competitive. So it, it, these things you get, you know, complicated, uh, but, you know, the, the, the bricks you have to understand. It's got nothing to do with fiat currency or anything else. The number one problem is political risk. And once the neocons here thought that they could undermine the Russian economy by taking them out of SWIFT, they basically put a, took a, a spike and drove it through the heart of the dollar. Uh, now the dollar was no longer an impartial currency that everybody could use. It suddenly now has political risk. Political risk. All right. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risks. Um, what do you think will be the go-to asset? Uh, can we get a run to 2500 even 3000 here on AU, our favorite metal, on, on continued issues and monetary profligacy? Eventually, yes. I mean, it, 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 if it pulls back and holds the 2000 level, okay, and then forms a base upon that, then it will bounce off of that, okay, and then you're looking out um, with a prospect of war. So if you, you, with war, you have to look at doing World War II. Um, silver basically. <laughs> Um, declines in value against copper and nickel. All right. So they replaced the, the five cent nickel during the uh, World War II with virtually pure silver because nickel was worth more. So look at nickel versus silver and you'll see when war is likely. All right. But it's all pointing to probably peaking out around 27. And <clears throat> If you see that, you'll see that gold was rising just recently, but not silver so much. So it's the the, the silver to gold ratio that's starting to, to to poke out, and that looks like it can go easily to 150. Um, whoa, 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 Martin! <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt. Did you just say silver? All right. So gold is is the main factor for gold. Hey, Martin, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Did, did I just hear 150 on a, a G silver? Uh, no, no, on the gold silver ratio. Okay, I was like, whoa. Okay. No, 150 silver to to one ounce of gold. 150 ounces. Yeah. Uh, the ratio reached, I think, 120 something. Just you know, in 2020. So the ratio should go up to about 150 or so. And that will most likely be driven by war. Um, but what do you say, though, Martin, to the gold and silver uh, fans here, aficionados, who are thinking, yeah, but, you know, we lost our silver stockpile, our strategic stockpile of 3 billion ounces in the U.S. And silver is absolutely critical to military operations along, I mean, obviously, with right iron, steel, copper, and so many others. But, I mean, it's really strategic and pretty hard to come by. 
Um, couldn't you see other, other nations than Russia, which is known for stockpiling a uh, thousand ounce bars? Putin is bonkers for, uh, and I think wisely so, uh, accumulating in their um, Moscow uh, stockpile there. Um, you know, silver bars along with AU. Um, what what if that occurred? I mean, couldn't we see an explosion in demand and decrease in supply of silver across the globe? Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it, it gold is still going to be the one that goes up even more. Um, so the ratio can expand, and it does usually during war. All right. Um, but the fact you have, you know, China and Russia stockpiling gold, et cetera, that comes back to what I was talking about, political risk. All right. It, it's got nothing to do with it. They think it's going to go up or down. All right. It's that it's like people right now have been buying real estate is to get money out of the banks, et cetera. All right. It's not a question. Does it go up 10 percent or down 10 percent? I'm just getting my money out of the bank. Um, when I talk to realtors around here, uh, houses that are one to five million, they're paying for, you know, they're being bought for cash. Not mortgages. That's people just getting money off the grid, as we say. Uh, and so you have countries basically doing the same thing with gold. To them, it's, gold is at least neutral. And it's, it's um, you know, whether it's going up or down, they don't really care. It's just that if they have dollars, it's a political risk. And they have euros, it's a political risk. They're not, they don't want the euro either. All right, so the West is basically kind of trashed itself, and that's why you have these other central banks starting to stockpile metals. Wow. Okay, stockpiling metals. Um, we appreciate your comments today on gold seek. Uh, but, you know, U.S. equities keep stunning everyone. And if I told you how many bears I've had on this show who refuse to let go of their bearish stance on the S&P 500 – month after month, year after year, and now 13 or 14 years later, they've been bearish since the lows of 2009. And I can't get over this. And guess what? There, I've had two bulls. One is Louis Navalier, brilliant. And one is Martin Armstrong, who said that money flows, global money flows, will favor a higher stock market, and you've been saying that for years. Do you tr expect that theme to persist, or are we near a top? We're near a temporary top, and we'll back off and <clears throat> after May. Uh, largely, you probably will get a negative uh, retraction as war progresses. All right. The first thing people will do is uncertainty is that they pull back. Uh, and but the same thing on the recessionary side, this uh, our computer is basically showing the peak in the economy um, would be 2024. And the date is ideally May 7th. Uh, and so we should be looking at a decline in in economic growth in general into about 2028. Um, but you're going to see more like the Sandys in the sense that you're looking at more of a stagflation type thing. So inflation is going to continue and it's going to outpace the, the, uh, <clears throat> the economic growth. I mean, you can see just with, with Biden's insane, you know, annual budget of seven and a half trillion dollars is unbelievable. But, um, I mean, I remember Ronald Reagan, and when I was dealing with the White House back then, everybody was freaking out because the national debt hit one trillion. Right? So um, now we spend that just in interest. You know, it, it's just insane. But um, the more he keeps doing this, uh, the worse it gets. And they don't, you know. Uh, I actually saw Victoria Newland saying, oh, all the money we give to Ukraine really helps our economy because it goes into the uh, uh, we're building weapons for them. You know, it's it's, it, you know, the, the joke is that Biden has created more billionaires than anybody in history. The problem is they're all in Ukraine. Oh, my. And the irony of that is, why are we ignoring 
are veterans of of foreign wars here who are finding themselves homeless. Why are we ignoring the fact that families are, even with food stamp plans, SNAP plans, are struggling to make ends meet? Why are we ignoring our borders and sending billions, instead of protecting our own country, to help a country which is doomed to fall? Well, there's two things uh, I would say that answer that. One is that the neocons... Uh, I mean, Victoria Newland just stepped down mainly because she was getting all the heat. But there's so many. The rest of them there in the State Department are just as bad. And they still call her for, for you know, for opinions. Uh, so, <clears throat> a, in my opinion, the, the, the neocons, and I know even like Bill Crystal, et cetera, his father is the one that started all this stuff. But um, they... In my opinion, they are uh, just angry that communism fell and they didn't get to shoot anybody. <clears throat> I can tell you that because I was down in Washington when when <clears throat> Reagan wanted to meet with Gorbachev, their response was, no, don't do it. You can never trust the Russian. So it, to me, it's just racism or something. You know, I don't really know, but... Um, I think communism fell and they didn't get to shoot anybody and they so they still just want to kill Russians. That's it. But um on the really this this whole thing we have to pay attention to is is uh with the borders. I happen to have had the mandate from Hong Kong, you know, when they were gonna be handed back to China in you know in ninety eight. And they knew I knew the Australian government, and they asked me to negotiate on their behalf to try and buy some land from them. And I met with a former president or prime minister, you know, Paul Keating. And everything I suggested, we're going to buy an island off off the coast. No. Uh, I finally said, well, let us come in. We'll take the upper left-hand you know, corner of Australia. Nobody's there. No. And I finally said, look, I got to check here. I have authority to pay off your national debt. You know, what's the problem here? And and I asked him, I said, is this racist? I thought, well, maybe they just don't like Chinese or something. And he said, no. He said, if we allowed them in, they were fleeing communism and they would change the politics of Australia. They would vote conservative and he was a labor government. This is what's going on with our border. They are deliberately letting all these people in to change the politics of the country. Already, you know, what has been going on, just the official numbers, the number of people they have left left in outnumber the entire population of five states. All right. Wyoming, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, et cetera. I mean, <clears throat> And that's not counting the undocumented ones that they're sneaking in. It came, it came out that, that Biden has flown in 320,000 directly into the United States to reduce the, the numbers at the border. I mean, these people are contriving everything against the American people. And they figure that he, you know, the basically what the rumor in Washington is he will grant them citizenship uh, before the election and they will all vote Democrat so that they can beat Trump. That's what this is all about. And uh, they are, are intending to offer because they want young males. They intend to offer them citizenship and they all have to go into the military and so then they can be sent overseas to go die for a country that they want to get in. And because uh, the volunteer rate has, has collapsed. Um, look, these people are just very devious. That's all I can tell you. I mean, they really do not care about the, the American people, our culture, anything. It's all about power. How can I retain power? Um I put a, a, a little video clip on my um, on my blog. You can Google it, um, FT, and then you'll see a video on there. They came out with a video of back in 2016 when Trump won. 
they were Davos. And they were Davos was all upset when Trump won because they suddenly democracy became populism. They realized they might be voted out of power. And it's a very interesting little video um, that I posted. I suggest watching it. But this is what these people are doing. They don't care about us. They don't care about anything. It's all about them and how do we retain power. Wow. Power it is. All right, Martin Armstrong, any uh, parting thoughts for our listeners today? Maybe what you see headed this way that the mainline media is missing. Well, I mean, they, well, they miss just about everything because they're really just propaganda anymore. But, um, uh, I, you look, you'll, you'll back off a little bit on the gold as long as it holds this two, you know, the 2000 area and build us some support. The next major turning point is probably going to be July. And they are looking to try and create some sort of war before the election. Um, deliberately, they're doing this. And because also the rumor in Washington is that no president has ever lost during war. And, um, you know, so gold is still going to be the neutral uh, factor. And I think, like I said, ex- expect when you start getting into war, uh, you're going to see it, you know, out, still outpace silver. But the main thing about gold is that it is is neutral. So it's the same thing, you know, for a Swiss, a German, from a, a Japanese, or anybody else to buy it. Um, it's a, it's a, it is a universal thing in that respect. But it, it, just keep in mind, it is more neutral, and it's not really about making a profit so much. It's about really protecting wealth at this stage because we're just heading into um, complete insanity over the next really five to seven years. Wow. Insanity over the next few years, says global economist and renowned financier, Mr. Martin Armstrong, not to mention what a fantastic author. Martin, why don't you tell people more about all the great books you've penned in your latest? Well, actually, I'm finishing up one right now um, on uh, why... yeah, no, I've got a, a bunch of them out. One I did, the, the plot to see is Russia. It's become the number one economic selling book on that, on Amazon. Um, they're getting, you know, tremendous. I did one on uh, Cleopatra showing that that was actually a proxy war. And she funded, a, you know, Mark Anthony to actually try to overthrow uh, the Roman Empire. I'm doing one now on why Caesar really crossed the Rubicon. It was the same thing we have today. It was a debt crisis. The, the, the Senate was an absolute corrupt dismay. I mean, um, so I'm, I'm continuing to try to, you know, pump a bunch of them out. I mean, I've, I've done, you know, the cycle of war. Uh, another one that, that everybody seems to really like is the manipulating the world economy. Um, that goes into the Fed and everything else and how things are really done. Uh, so all these things have been, they, the books have been selling, you know, quite amazingly. And to actually hit the number one economic book on Amazon is saying something, I guess. Martin, I got to give you a big hat tip. Number one on economic book on the Bezos machine, Amazon.com. Hey, let's hope that uh, Jeff Bezos offers you a ticket on one of his uh, rides into the ionosphere right up there. Is it Blue Origin? I think that's the name of his rocket company. I mean, he's got to. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, ma- you're printing money for him there. Martin Armstrong, we appreciate you and a huge hat tip for all that you do. Just a favorite here, and you just blow up our numbers. Every time, one of my editors, Dave, is always saying, Chris, you won't believe the numbers that Martin Armstrong brings in, especially his videos. So hopefully we'll have you back up on video soon. I mean, even we did one that that I was shocked. It uh, exceeded a million. Um, 
when they invade you know, Hamas. But... They, they appreciate you. They appreciate the truth. You don't sugarcoat it. You call them like you see them. And, you know, veracity goes a long way, I think, with the online community. Well, like I say, the forecasts come from the computer. It's not me personally. Um, so <clears throat> that's why they've been consistent over the, over time. Consistency is good. Martin, we want to thank you, my friend. Well, thank you for inviting me. Take care. Long before the mountains came to be,